<laughs> is that okay? Yeah. A little less short. Hello. No, but wait, hold on. Can hear us? Hello, they can hear you. Yeah. In fact, you're you're being recorded. <laughs> so forward in the break room he came by today. I, I... Okay. We're all being recorded. Posterity. For the YouTube. For people to pile in to this Zoom experience. <laughs> Wonderful. Where are you, Jean Louis Farge and Gina Wright Cart? In space. <laughs> we breathe. We are in motion in the space. Yeah, you're you're in space and motion. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Ready for liftoff. <laughs> That's great. Is this the last one in the series? This is the 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 climatic final Grand discussion. Topic. This, this is this is the way we're 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 seeing this wrapped up. <laughs> that's, a, that's a minimum for us, you know. <laughs> of course, <laughs> no it's, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> so could we start when we have three thousand uh, euro? That's exact. That's what we're waiting for. Exactly. Uh, well, tell me when we are at three thousand. Okay. Isn't it like you're closing out with the non-academics? I don't, I, 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 I would beg to differ. I think you might be the future of academia. You want to start this now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I usually look to Neil and Jacob to give me a sign as to when we've, uh, we should start. I take, I take their signs very seriously. We'll give it like a couple minutes. Couple more minutes. Usually people have trickle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's happening. Is Neil with us? Jacob's just a still photo and I don't see Yeah. Jacob is not in motion. No, oh, now he's in motion. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in motion. Tired of being on the computer. It's good to see you, but thank you for being here. Sorry, yes, Jacob. Okay. There's so much to yeah, be, that's fine. Go for to it. To be covered today, so I might just start. Um, welcome, everyone, to the final episode of the lecture series associated with Public Design Core. And uh, yeah, Neil is excited <laughs> to see this as the final. I'm Anya Sorota, Associate Dean of Academic Initiatives, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Neil Robinson and Jacob Comerci, who have guided and shaped this experimental program over the course of this summer with an extraordinary cohort of 50 students working on eight projects with community partners and exploring how architecture and planning can make a difference. So with that in mind, uh, we are joined today by Jean-Louis Farge and Gina Reichardt, who may well be two of my favorite people. Uh, that find themselves in one room uh, with some very attractive uh, Mexican furniture. And so by way of an introduction, uh, Gina Reichardt in many ways is an architect's architect. She started her career by working in um, heavy firms in Cincinnati and New Orleans and New York, Detroit. Um, and she has a degree from Tulane University, a BARC and an MARC from the Cranbrook Academy of Art and somewhere in her career, a change, a pivot took place, a pretty radical pivot took place where she turned her attention uh, to what I affectionately consider a kind of activist posture toward architecture. And she incorporated with her partner, uh, Mitch Cope, uh, an approach to urban design, urban morphology that's guided by uh, principles of equity and inclusion before those terms were uh, ubiquitous in, in our college campuses, uh, but truly lived through the processes of creating inclusive uh, spaces and territories uh, for people from all sorts of backgrounds and from all sorts of disciplines. 
the uh, kind of the, the, the envelope with which we understand her, her work can be um, perceived through Powerhouse Productions, which is a nonprofit and an agglomerate of projects that together, I would say, uh, create one of the most compelling experimental cultural infrastructures in the city of Detroit in constant motion, in constant transformation, and uh, always bringing um, the most compelling and inspiring programming to the forefront in a context where everyone is included and invited. I have watched that project grow and transform, and I'm always um, incredibly touched knowing the complexity of the work um, by its success, longevity, and capacity to, to adapt. And we're also joined by Jean-Louis Farge, who is the co-founder of Akoaki. And um, this is a difficult introduction for me to make because when someone knows maybe a little bit too much, uh, we must be careful in editing, but um, he is my partner in practice um, and uh, in life in many ways. And Jean-Louis has an uh, unorthodox approach to architecture, let's say. Um, in his early years in Paris, he worked as a photographer and a construction manager um, and uh, ultimately moved to the US. And you'll discover that he's had one hard time uh, dropping his Rhode Island accent, uh, which he's carried with him uh, all of these years. But in the work that we do at Akoaiki, I would say that uh, Jean-Louis' approach is truly boots on the ground where he um, engages, collaborates, confronts, and critically approaches a plethora of partners, uh, activists, institutions, um, policies that he attempts to make sense of and um, to, to inflect with the capacities of design to make positive impact. And uh, so this, this uh, conversation, and I'm delighted that it's a conversation rather than a lecture, will be uh, extremely informal. Um, and so the, the two of them are in one space that has like slightly acoustic uh, problems, but we hope it will work. And I will be guiding um, the conversation through a series of slides, which I will share, and will prompt uh, Jean-Louis and Gina through, through those slides to reflect and ruminate on their work and on the possible futures for socially inflected uh, design in transformative urban contexts. So without further ado, everyone, let's welcome Jean-Louis and Gina while I attempt to share this PowerPoint, <laughs> this slide deck. Okay. Yay, that was a yay, but the host has disabled participant screening. You should be good now, sorry. Great, no problem. Okay. Oops, we don't wanna do that. We still don't want to do that. We just want to present. Okay, can everyone see this? Great. So the conversation today, Gina and Jean-Louis, is around questions of governance. Um, very often architects, uh, specifically architects, step into situations where there's a binary opposition between client and service delivery sector the architect and their, the, the plethora of consultants with whom we work. It's very unusual uh, to have architects, designers, urbanists weigh in on the very governance and management of space, ownership policies, and stewardship of the built environment. So today's conversation is just about that. What are the trials and tribulations associated with attempting to inflect governance and affiliating governance as a design problem um, in the production of the built environment. And so the first question that we have for you is uh, around why governance matters. Why should architects, designers, urbanists be concerned with how the stu stewardship of the built environment is organized and designed? Is it really a design problem? And who are the people involved? Okay, so I'm going to. <laughs> well, I think um, one of the reasons that I took this pivot from a traditional sort of firm practice to whatever it is that I'm doing now, <laughs> uh, 
um, is I think this question of people and who I, who I was interested in working with and how I was interested in working with them. Uh, and honestly, that included myself. Um, so it was an entirely selfish motivation. Um, I had ideas that I wanted to investigate in like space, time, and the built environment. And I wasn't interested in wooing a client, which is what I did at a lot of the firms, you know, um, or sitting back and waiting or for or chasing someone with money and means, whether it was a business, a corporation, a person, a law firm, an ad firm, like they're all perfectly fantastic people who exist in the world and deserve architectural services, but that's not where my interests were at all. Um, especially because I was living in this neighborhood where I live and work still now um, and commuting downtown to offices. And there was just this huge disconnect between um, my everyday life and the needs, I don't know, the, it's not so much problem solving, but the, the environment that I was living in and then where I was going to quote unquote work in this traditional office. And, um, and I was far more interested in sort of where I woke up and went to sleep every day and night um, and what could be done there and less and less interested in providing services to those who had the means in the traditional sense. So um, this is partly this idea of self-initiated projects. Like if I have an idea, I wanna develop it and figure out how to bring it into the world. It's definitely more, I think, of a studio artist approach, which my partner Mitch it is, both trained in practices as a studio artist. And so that was definitely a big influence on the way I kind of moved forward. Gina, is client still the right word? Like, <laughs> are you working with clients? No, I feel like client is a very transactional term. It brings up like, um, it's, well, it immediately starts to talk about like contract negotiations and fees and services and um, this idea that we'll talk about more, I think, starting and stopping points, you know, scope of work. And, and all of those things exist differently for better or worse in the kind of practice that I, not just me, but the two of you also pursue. Um, it's more complicated. It's less capital driven. Um, it's not about well, it's not about finishing a project, which I think we'll talk more about, but it's also not about this bottom line of like budget and schedule. Again, for better or worse. <laughs> you have to, I think about, um, I think about project timelines differently. Um, mm -hmm. And I think about this idea of client more about um, developing a relationship with mm -hmm. people who, um, again, it's not even ownership or stewardship of the work. It's more like who is going to experience this place in this project, who's going to use it or pass through it, or who's going to have a relationship with it. So it's much more relational and far less mm -hmm. transactional. Gina, for people unfamiliar with your work at Powerhouse Productions, could you, it's very difficult to summarize the plethora of activities that you take. This is great. Pardon. <laughs> this is great. a great 60 degree video tour that we should link to. <laughs> but for example, what is this image that we're looking at? So this is an image of right at Sculpture Park. It's a skate park that we built as Firehouse Productions along the Davis and Expressway in Detroit. Um, I love this image for a bunch of different reasons. For one, the skate park is kind of my favorite project because, um, because of so much letting go that I had to learn to be comfortable with of it. Meaning that like, there's no key, there's no lock, there's no gate, there's no defined boundary of the park. And so people come and go at will. It's um, in theory open from dawn to dusk, but that is also not true. Um, and but I love that like there's no there's no key holder for the space, and it's very confusing to people who owns and operates the space. And one of the reasons I love this image so much is because I came upon this scene coming home off the Davidson Expressway one day. No one called me to ask if they could do a video shoot that day. There were no, again, for better or worse, legal documents signed about liability. There was no question of litigation. And the reason it works is because the community really feels ownership of the space. Um, people are comfortable there. They're comfortable showing up, bringing mm -hmm. their whole cultural selves, making noise, um, and really claiming the space. Um, that's not to say I don't get phone calls about rental fees and negotiations and liability, mm -hmm. but they're always mm -hmm. corporations or advertising mm -hmm. or marketing agents. And not from anyone who lives or 
lives in the immediate area or resides, mm -hmm. does everyone there kind of understands or knows or maybe has spoken to me or has spoken to someone who's spoken to me in the past about this space is like publicly available and accessible? So there's an underlying understanding that there's a co-stewardship, informal, uh, if you will, that uh, helps guide, but still someone is responsible. So for example, when you get a blight remediation ticket, yeah, that falls on who's, us. okay, <laughs> that still falls on you. There is still, there is still this blasted um, ownership <laughs> structure in the United States that we have to abide by. So yes, at the end of the day, the paperwork is like in powerhouse production's name, the property taxes, the drainage fees, the flight ticket, mm -hmm. all of the nonsense is in powerhouse production's name. Um, yep. We see it as a facility, it's very, like it's an important public space that's been developed in the neighborhood and it's really mm -hmm. the facility for all, that functions more as a commons. So with a commons or commoning, there, there are rules and regulations, but they're really more of and from the user group and not kind of like come down from on high. But when the, the rules from on high do come down, like the blight tickets, um, those do fall on us. So it's funny, we're kind of operating with two different systems. There's the system of the everyday like use um, mm -hmm. that I think is more along the lines of like the conversation we were just having before the camera came up. And then there's the system of uh, US municipal governance and capitalism. Mm -hmm still abide by so we're kind of like uh, we kind of put mm -hmm. in these different ways okay that's really helpful to understand um there are so many layers with which we'll have to unpeel these questions of governance and how far we can go in collectively stewarding um, and where we can begin to inflect policy as designers rather so than solely uh space um but that i it's a it's a very quick introduction to your work, but um, the bottom line is that you identified sites of potential interest. You fundraised in order to uh, transform those sites into collective cultural infrastructure. You steward those sites, but you co-create programming to activate them so that they're in constant transformation and um, integrated into the life of a neighborhood. Is that fair? This is a good, um, the salad table, <laughs> which is the, the, the image you're looking at now, is a good example of the co pro, well, the programming that's developed by others, um, and also like co stewards or the collective ownership of the spaces. So, this is a project of the Hitchlands Ensemble, the Hitchlands, Liza Bielby and Richard Newman are the core members. Uh, they developed this performance series called Utopian Dinners. And this salad table is a scene from one of the U utopian dinner, um, like public, know, public workshops, maybe they would call it. I'm probably mm -hmm. getting, um, but it's the idea that like we're going to share a salad together, but we're going to do mm -hmm. it with all the ingredients collectively on the table, and nothing's been prepared, but the mm -hmm. the, uh, the ingredients are all there. And again, just obviously pre-COVID, mm -hmm. <laughs> this was a collective yeah. of both like making and mm -hmm. enjoying of the salad. Um, yeah. So the two, yeah, there's like their bowls and knives and uh, peelers, but it's all just sort of like tossed top out together on the table. And, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, it was one of like many components of the Utopian dinner series. Yeah, it's a, it's a very striking metaphor for what you just described in terms of seeking an, a novel form of governance. I'm going to move on to the next slide, which um, I think it, this is a snapshot that was taken by you, Jean-Louis Farge. <laughs> and, and, and with you, if we could turn, it, we, we started with Gina uh, talking about um, her action, her relationship to government governance. Um, but in, in this case, I think there's a backstory that we might be able to address, which is how uh, your particular practice became interested in questions of governance and its relationship to design and urban space? So, first of all, I want to share some uh, concepts and ideas I've been looking at and thinking about for years. Is um, I, I see architecture as a, as a tool and not as a goal. Um, I see architecture and ephemeral space as part of, of the, the built environment. The, the word ephemeral with my French accent, of course, sounds pretty conflictual with architecture. But I believe 
um, the time you spend in the building is very ephemeral. When you go to the Guggenheim, you spend two hours in your life, two, twice maybe. So the, the feeling and the use of structure is it depend of the, the, the person who are going to be part of it for a very short of time. So the idea of uh, um, very rigid and structured um, use of building, I, I think there's a space who, who gave us, gave me the opportunity to work and, and to, to uh, look at what I am more interested, that's mean the human use of space, program, culture, economy, all of these elements are part of the, the way I, I look at uh, the field that we work in. Uh, there, is a, there is an architect, French architect, who has been a very huge uh, inspiration for, for me and I've been for Anya too. His name is Patrick Bouchard. He's, uh, he was an academic architect and uh, started to, to build when he was like 50 years old. And uh, he never called himself an architect. He called himself, and I have some notes, a, a negotiator, a politician, and a builder. And this is somebody who influenced a lot of young French architects in Europe. He built maybe 50 uh, government structures in Europe. And this is a really an example of a, almost like a, a field between planning and architecture. And between this, uh, in this field, you can see some uh, precedent like Belle de Mai. It's uh, in Marseille, um, huge factory, nobody uses it anymore. And he worked for years on this project, tried to build a governance with election, with representant of, of the people who use the building. And uh, it's one of the most important and successful uh, independent uh, freestanding governance and, and unfinished architecture uh, in, in France. So this is somebody, this is one of, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, project. You can see uh, is a skate park uh, reference to. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so this is, this is uh, one of the first uh, uh, major and, and, and discussion I, I want to have. Uh, this is another project he did in, uh, in the north of France. And, and this is the same process. We studied this process and we tried to apply that in our practice in the US. Uh, there is what we call an uh, emergent program. That's mean local activists and artists who have uh, already some, uh, some, some vision of art and culture. And the architect become the partner and to design the first part of, of, of this, this kind of project is always the governments. Who is going to work on this project? How you are going to make decision? And who is the, the owner? Who will become the owner of the collective work? Um, this is, this, is a, this example, very interesting in Calais, if you go in France, you, go, you should go there. Um, I have some more notes, I'm going to do this. Are you time or not time? So this is not, this is uh, exactly the, 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 the unfinished, undone kind of uh, architecture where everybody feels uh, very welcome and uh, the economical uh, uh, business plan of this kind of project is, is usually non-profit. There is a support of the cultural minister in France. And uh, this is a, like a place where young people, older people, artists, no artists, uh, can get together and feel uh, uh, the space as, uh, as theirs. <laughs> I appreciate you bringing up Patrick Bouchon as an inspiration for um, our own practice. Specifically, I would say, in, in addition to, to how you've talked about the coming undoneness of the architecture as being a positive quality that creates inclusive possibility for continual transformation. Um, he also, I think, inflected what we understand is, uh, as engagement. 
where rather than hosting specific engagement programming, he designed ways for um, architects to embed engagement spaces directly in the architecture and for that embedded cabana of sorts to constantly function from the day of a project's inception to its continuous transformation over time. So um, that brings us to the next question, uh, which is these projects, the question of time, and the notion that these projects um, do not operate according to normative timetables for delivery of um, projects and, and uh, scopes of work that can be clearly determined and clearly charted. And in many ways, for example, Patrick Bouchon saw that as a positive attribute, that the life of a structure could continue to evolve. But in the reality of our built environment, that can also be a challenge. So I wanted to turn this over to you, uh, Gina, who you mentioned, you mentioned in the um, first portion of this conversation that uh, these projects are never quite done. And if you could comment a little bit about the time it takes to produce the framework for an ever evolving cultural infrastructure. Sure, um, I don't know, we're, we're not seeing the images, but is that just us or is that? No, there's something going on with the images. Okay. I mean, I can still talk, but I didn't know if you knew. Um, I mean, I think, you know, some of the trick is again with these two systems. There's like the system of the way we, we work and who's using or, you know, has access to the facilities or has time to share and experience the facilities through events and things. And then there's like, um, the municipality and all of their uh, rules and regulations. And then, you know, it's just like safety and building safety and things. So, um, so I, I end up using the word phasing a lot. And I'll talk about phases because, because when it comes to construction, terminology and management and things like uh, building code, which is important and, um, and dealing with inspectors and, and also funders, honestly, like I talk, we, talk, we use the word phases and we think about the projects in phases. And so there are, or maybe you call them chapters, if you want to be this technical, but it's this idea of like, how, how do you parse a project out um, into like starting and stopping points, um, maybe like milestones in a project or a longer timeline, which is sometimes circular, <laughs> but to get to a point where it's both serving um, a user group we're addressing the concerns of the municipality or whatever litigious bodies might have oversight over us. Um, and, but, and also honestly, like there's the sanity of the person, people <laughs> behind and involved in the project. So that this idea of like duration doesn't wear you down, but you can kind of come to like resting points. And so you're like, okay, we raised this much money. We have about this much time, energy capacity to commit to something. And so um, I think Playhouse is the example that came to mind first. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of how do we pause uh, and maybe even begin using and occupying this space in a safe, responsible way, but we know it's not done. Like, but we know it's done, it's, it's functional and therefore it can be activated and appreciated in different ways by different people. Um, and in the meantime, like there's stuff that can happen behind the scenes to figure out like, okay, what's the next milestone we want to get to? So I think like there's that kind of time, the duration of a construction project when you're talking about things like construction and capital improvement, and, you know, the reality of money um, and also people's schedules, you know, like how long can we commit to helping renovate this place? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and then there's also like this idea of time in terms of like long-term relationship building with, a, with people in a place. And I guess one of the things I should point out with my practice is that I live and work in the neighborhood where these projects, these project houses, the Powerhouse Productions Network is, is being developed. So I have a very like personal intimate relationship with time and space in the neighborhood. Um, and that's, you know, not true, obviously, of everyone's practice. It's not, I don't think it's a necessary component, but it means that there are things that I'm able to understand and know um, 
that isn't an engagement exercise in this kind of like outside consultant sense. It's an engagement of like everyday life. So just Anya, we don't have any image on the screen. Yeah. So um, I'm having some technical difficulties where my computer is about to crash. Um, so I wonder if we might be able to share the slides from your deck. Oh. No, we, from us, we cannot. But, uh, I can also, no, if I'll you send me. Yeah, I'll do that. So, and I'm unable to send, I'm unable to use my Chrome to send anything to anyone, oh. unfortunately. No, I, I should have done it before, Jacob, I wasn't thinking. No Thank you so much. Sorry about that. So when Gina is busy, I can talk a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get more space. Yes. Um, always I describe, uh, so it's true, the time. The time is, uh, is, is uh, of course, very important. But uh, the, the design, I always say, is the point of the iceberg. And the amount of work you do before you have any design is, is pretty huge. And there is no way to, to shorter this time. There is time for communication, discussion, uh, strategy, and, and uh, research. We work in, in only about research based on, on the data and the research. So there is, there is a pre 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 design if you want, who cannot be seen, cannot be really represented. And this is part of the time that everybody who are interested to go in this field need to understand are gonna be um, unseen, if we can say that this way. Um, so that's, that's the time. I, I also, uh, uh, okay, we are going back to the image. Let me know wherever you want me to go. Yeah. Um, well, that's, I mean, you should keep talking. If you want to skip ahead to. Yeah, so I was, I was describing how uh, in, in the work we do, we have uh, this uh, amazing part who is not seen and is so important. Um, and if you don't have the right tone, the right, the right way to, to look at the project, the design are, are not going to be as expected. So um, that's a very important part in the, in the timing. The notion, I like this, this idea in the landscape. There is a uh, Gilles Clément reference, uh, the garden in motion. And I'm not going to go into details of the garden, but I like to have this idea also the building in motion. Uh, and I know it's very conflictual with the, the spirit of architecture of the, the love for details and the love of the, the finished product. But the, the, the work uh, Gina does or the work we have done was always attached to this notion of, of building in motion or st structure in motion. And uh, that makes very unique the, the work we do. And, and it's a very thin line that you need to, to work as a professional and as a designer. Um, so th that's, that's something I wanted to share with everybody about this notion of building in motion. But I love that idea, which we, it's a new concept for me, but it, it resonates. I mean, I think this way, I just didn't have the, the verbiage to put to it. But for me, it's like, you're obsessed with landscape in a way, and I'm sort of obsessed with this idea of geology and geologic time. Um, and I think it's also like people think about geology as this like stable static thing, but it's actually the ground is always moving. So it's not, um, it's just a different time scale. And I love the, this idea that, um, I think that's what, it makes sense for, <laughs> like in architecture, um, a project is never really finished. And last year I talked to my thesis students a lot about or the, the framework for the course was about maintenance and care. And it is sort of this idea of like, when does an, uh, traditionally, I think architects sort of say, and like we're done, and they call it, and it's this handing over the keys to a client, and then they walk away. 
And I think in our practices, uh, it's never that clear, or we don't even think about it that way. It really is an ongoing relationship over time. And, um, and things are always changing. And whether it's the programming is changing and the facility adapts or accommodates a new use or an event, um, I don't know. I think it's um, so yeah. things might pause and things might move quick or quickly or slowly. Like it's just a, this idea of the like, time is elastic and architecture is part of those time flows and not somehow separate or outside of that. So the, the, the this idea give you some space where you see suddenly so there is there is somebody who need to make a decision how the building is going to be used, how the building could be damaged or not, or it could be improved. And this is where is the space for the governments. So you can be a collective owner or you can be a private owner. And the power you have by, by the ownership is huge because you have a direct impact on the culture of, uh, of the space where, where you will come over and bring the, the own asset. Um, so that's that's why and this is the topic of, of this conversation is like uh, when I when we look at the precedent in Europe, most of the, the space used by uh, collective artists used are owned by the government and are public space. And uh, this is not the case in the US at all. You cannot go and squat factory and do a cultural center. Uh, so the, the the mix between access to wealth ownership is, is give a more challenging kind of work compared to Europe to be done in the US. And uh, this is where the last 10 years we have been working, trying to figure out what would be the, the architecture of, of organization to be able to share a common structure. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an example, this is a, the unique and the first a uh, land trust in the city of Detroit. Uh, I work on this with uh, a lot of people for five years. And it was very complex to get up to now to have a running legal uh, collective of land trust where you have six acres of land. And the six acres of land are ruled by system of legal documents uh, who they give you the framework, how to, to manage, how to, to share all this land, and how it's gonna be when you are gone. That's me, all the rules are designed for the next 100 years. And this is what amazing experience of land trust is. And there is a space between ultra collectivist uh, system in the world and ultra private entity in the US, for example, there is a space where um, you can really build and, and, and design a structure and governance who are a third kind of economical system. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this is, uh, we, we can talk about this project specifically, what was, was the challenge, what is the role of this. But this is one of the very, uh, successful and, and when we talk about time we are talking about five years of work to be yeah. able to have a legal entity to run five years six years yeah and so first of all thank you both for illustrating that you truly are adaptive in the face of our technological challenges so thank you for that uh, we're back in action um, but let's talk about all of these in quantitative terms so this for example Jean-Louis you're talking about a project where it took five years to create a strategy to draft rule sets for the future management of collectively stewarded properties. And nothing so far has been built. The, the design problem was the design of a framework. Is that, is that fair? Yes, and, and because of uh, the flexibility you need to have, to have uh, in the US, the way everything most of the, of the work go to uh, philanthropy and foundation. Uh, yeah. we, did, we, we have to start to work on the, like what I call a, a master yeah. plan of opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's when the philanthropy come over and say, you know, I'm interested mm -hmm. in uh, women. 
You know, yeah, I yeah. have $200,000 to spend on women. Of course, you want a women in your land. <laughs> you have $200,000, we will do that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so you need, to have, you need to match the rule of use of land mm -hmm. uh, of, this, of what is the political mm -hmm. framework for yourself and for the collective yeah. and, and uh, uh, following the, the, the philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So this is very, it's like a puzzle. It mm -hmm. takes years and nobody knows exactly the outcome. The, the only outcome we know yeah. Then mm -hmm. those speculation can be mm -hmm. ever done on this land. Mm -hmm. Could I ask a question about how this relates to the academy? Um, in terms of, you know, Jean-Louis, you, you as an autodidact enjoy very much being outside of academic frameworks. And Gina, you've recently begun to sort of navigate in, in the academy. The projects you're talking about are in many ways antithetical to the tenure track uh, strategies and to, to, to modes of um, achieving success in academic milieus because the projects you're talking about sometimes take close to a decade or more. So it's very difficult to have a long list of accomplishments when the kind of effort and the timetable is elastic and sometimes doesn't correlate with the expectations of a research institution. Um, does that mean those two can't coexist or does something need to change? <laughs> that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Coexist. <laughs> I mean, I, will, I don't know how this fits in, but there's something about when academics when start coming, start showing interest in your work and showing up to want to include you in their syllabus or write a paper about you or maybe a dissertation mm -hmm. about your work and all of a sudden you're like well, wait a minute maybe I should be the one talking about my own work so I don't know <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like I sometimes feel like I'm in this funny position where I'm being talked about while I'm trying to collect my thoughts about what I'm doing because I'm so much in it um mm -hmm. does that make sense or does that address yeah. it? I don't know well mm -hmm. I have a different I have a different, yeah. I have a different strategy and because uh, I have the umbrella of Anya uh, Sirota um, and, and the Common College, we, 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 all the work I have done and we have done, we, we imagine this is research. Yeah. And when you do research, the failure is part of the success. Mm -hmm. And so you protect yourself and your motivation mm -hmm. by not looking at failure as a disaster, but more as a, a step forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he has been for us really a way to protect ourselves and have always the motivation to keep working and do research. So the, the and overlap, overlap between design mm -hmm. and, and our practice and academy, I believe is somewhere right here. Is mm -hmm. the, the head, I'm not going to repeat myself, but everybody understands this, this concept. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. was a very moral and, and very intense and profound kind of a perspective for us. I will, a quick addition to that. I, um, yeah, there are these terms that I learned um, years ago now, but um, like proof of concept mm -hmm. uh, or what's it, like pilot project <laughs> or <laughs> what are some other ones? They're like, they're these terms that actually not only helped uh, me be like, okay, well, this is just like, like you know, we'll, we'll We'll kind of package this chunk as a thing, mm -hmm. and a project, a thing itself, with mm -hmm. um, with like a complete story to it, and we'll think mm -hmm. about it in terms of like you know a mm -hmm. testing of ideas, and this is where it got to, and then yeah, like the lessons learned that come out of that. Mm -hmm. um, that also yeah. helps with the building department, honestly. Again, this idea of yeah. like, it's also about like, well, this isn't like um, I don't know. I remember having a conversation with an electrical inspector we started talking about one of the solar systems and one of the off-grid houses in terms of like a proof of concept for yeah. like a case study house and all of a sudden they were like oh okay and like that gave us the green light to be like okay and I was like god language really matters exactly <laughs> language yeah. we talked about this yesterday yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Could, and, uh, yeah. The, pla the planner of their own language audience language they, and audience. Language. They don't need to have an outcome, really. Mm -hmm. 
the outcome is very blurry, very, very loose. Architectural, you need to have an outcome, you know? Something tangible. Tangible, you need to show something. You just, so is, is the, the, this um, not guilty of, uh, of failure or, or not guilty of doing, or doing research and, and test, you know, technique <laughs> test uh, is, is very important. If anybody mm -hmm. wants to go in this, in this part of the small field of architecture, mm -hmm. a very important part to understand. I, I think, you know, we, we have this structured as a conversation in four parts. It'll probably be three parts so that we can open this up for questions. But um, you brought up this, this notion of outcomes, tracking your outcomes. And Jean-Louis, you even hinted at the reality of failure, right. that uh, there's accountability to be had. There's a, a, a question about um, how this inflects uh, the future morphologies of urban conditions beyond the project um, and the perception of impact by partners and others uh, into what a particular project achieves in the collective imaginary when ultimately these are non-democratic processes. These are self-initiated processes. These are spaces that are funded through foundation funding, meaning not tax dollars, um, often, and so um, outcomes matter. And how does one deal with understanding um, the repercussions of these projects and their possible failures? I'm gonna turn this one over to you just because we have the image in front of us, um, Gina. And I'll, be, I'll maybe just briefly touch on, mm -hmm. I'll be brief because more time, but um, yeah, I think some of that has to do with like, how do you measure success? In these projects, and um, it's something I also ask my students to do is like, well, how would you define success for your project this semester um, in advance? But like, so the skate park, <laughs> we've been talking mostly about that, but um, you know, um, in letting go of control, it also means that things, it's, it's not all good things that happen there that I am or not aware of. There's also, and this is a tame image by all means, but like, there's this desire by people who use the park to light things on fire and blow shit up. So sometimes it's fireworks and fireworks are festive and beautiful, but sometimes they're, I mean, it's also a small explosion that is sometimes not as controlled as we would like. And the fires, like sometimes it's people cooking hot dogs and hamburgers, and sometimes it's a bonfire that is out of control, highly visible along a public expressway. So <laughs> this is a tame image that we have of like a condition that we don't have control over. And you yeah. know, like, as far as we know, not on wood, like, no one has been hurt beyond like a typical playground imagery at the skate park, but it could mm -hmm. very well happen. And that feel like, I don't even let my head go there sometimes because that does mm -hmm. open up to like litigious fear mm -hmm. and, and also like res responsibility of like, yeah. you know, a mom. And so, <laughs> yeah. so things are like sort of just, um, and honestly, we rely on the community of users at the park to like help us keep that in check. So when we are, when, Again, I live down the street, so I'm semi-aware of when things go too far. And there are a network of people that I can contact to say, what is going on? Who do I need to talk to? You need to pass this message along. And, and the people that I'm kind of like, they love the park, they feel ownership of the park, so they also like want it to be there for them and not like have problems or have it go away. So whatever, like there, you know, there's with the very, um vast user group like you just know the people who can help disseminate messages and then circle back and you have conversations with them so again you're back to like client relationships and use of space and, um, but there have been for sure failures at the park the first build was a complete nightmare disaster for me um i joked that it almost killed me but i'm barely joking like it was too much it was too much too fast a um, part of that is philanthropic schedules and I felt this pressure to get something done despite our capacity. Mm -hmm. um, it was also the 18 months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the 18 months. I mean, we broke ground on the skate park in 2012. So it is now uh, what, what's the math on that? It's now <laughs> what, nine, nine years. And yeah. um, so sure the 18 months, you know, like I wrote the report and I wrapped it up as best I could for the people who funded like that phase build, uh, but it is not finished. Um, and yeah. that's a whole other too. This is actually, again, this is not the image that I wanted to show to be talking about failure with the park. I actually kind of love that uh, this was part of one of the music video shoots that happened there. 
But the, the image I was looking for that I couldn't find was a picture of a car that crashed into the park. Um, oh. This happens like semi regularly, I'm afraid, because of our location along the Davidson Expressway. And it's like, I don't know how to talk to MDOT about what how mm. they engineered the road. Um, but one time I walked up on the park and there was a car left running that had hit, come into the park and like hit one of the skate features and it was just like left there running. And I walked up with a tour, like, I, I don't know if she was from a philanthropy, I can't remember that, but I was like with another person from outside of the neighborhood who was just like there for the tour. And I was yeah. like, what have we done? <laughs> what must you be thinking? What am I doing here? Why is this car doing here? Mm -hmm. And like, why have we done any of this? So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. there are these like, I don't know, uh, questions, existential yeah. questions, pragmatic questions. Um, yeah all of these projects um and i think you know there is this thing about property and ownership or stewardship and like there's both rights and responsibilities to all of mm -hmm. you that i sort of laugh and make jokes of because that's how i deal with it but it's actually like incredibly <laughs> it can't be incredibly serious yeah. or um yeah. have an impact on like my daily life and my family yeah and so everything that comes with that so. and i want to uh, i want to add something you know, sorry about this uh general uh, system where um, the shrinking of the civic space in general that's been is that like we do experimentation of the diy civic space because of the collapse of the collective investment in the in the common ground so imagining coming from private entity or non-profit to re rebuild civic space when there is all shrinking on the, on the, on the whole system about the, 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 those kind of space is, is a risky business and, and challenging. Can I add something on that? Yeah. So the skate, for example, the skate park is like, when we started that project, it was at a time when the city of Detroit was defunding the parks and rec department. That, like the city department was shrinking. We bought the land initially, the, the first five lots we bought, we bought from the city of Detroit. Um, and then we built this public, semi-public, publicly accessible, privately owned space that was free and open to all. So anyway, I just have to But this is what I mean, yeah, it's yeah. like, mm -hmm. you didn't put a fence around with a ticket. Everybody, anytime during the day or night can come in. Yeah. So it's private owned, private built, in space and mm -hmm. that's for the for the better and for the worse that's mean when you have legal uh, yeah. challenge it goes to the private ownership when uh, you have success it goes to the collective, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the collective. so mm -hmm. this is the, the profession of, of urban designer looking at how to go back and take back uh, civil, civic uh, space is, is a very important part of the work and, and the challenge in the coming years. Uh, I always make fun of this uh, Dunkin' Donuts Center in Providence, you know, <laughs> where uh, <clears throat> there was a civic center who has been transferred to Dunkin' Donuts. And don't, I have no thing against Dunkin' Donuts. They make good coffee, good donuts. I love them. But having, having a, a concert uh, recorded on Dunkin' Donuts and, and to have an album with uh, Nina Simon on the Dunkin' Donuts Center, <laughs> I cannot and, and I cannot take it. I believe there is there is a place where corporation need to stay away a little bit, and they just need to do the job and pay the taxes, so the community can have a civic center. That's my. Uh, that's they can my, have a concession stand, right? Center, but they don't need their name painted on. They don't need to have a pizza on the top of the stadium. They don't need to have whatever. This is, and and so the. The, the work of uh, the work we do is how to 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 take over some small pieces missing and do a DIY uh, civic space. Uh, that's that's really uh, and, and there is so many ways to do it. Uh, we, this is when we have some recipe. You have some recipe every architect and your balance has different recipe. But the, the main goal is that you don't have a client who want to, to take back and uh, give back the uh, civic space. I, I appreciate your uh, shout out to Dunkin' Donuts and to uh, the, the pizza place in, in Detroit, et cetera. But 
you know, I, I feel like this conversation uh, could go on for um, a, a, a while because these are issues that are very difficult uh, to negotiate. They're not binary oppositions because the, between what is good or bad in the urban environment. They're every shade of gray and complexity and layered ethical dilemmas about what architecture can do, what is the place of collectivity, uh, what is the place of public cultural infrastructure, who is responsible, who can work on galvanizing its importance and regenerating the notion that the public realm is an important collective asset. These things are difficult for us to, to, to sort of land on in terms of clear process forward. And I think you've really um, made clear that a series of collective experiments are what's driving a scenario where uh, de democratically partitioned, apportioned resources are no longer available. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this because we're getting to the end of our hour. And uh, frankly, we need to host you somewhere in, in the live, or you should come see the, the, the walking tour of Powerhouse Productions. And you should visit with Jean-Louis in the office um, at CAS Collective and um, connect more closely. But in the meantime, if we could open the floor uh, to any questions, um, this audience might have, it would be really wonderful. But uh, appreciation for your candor and uh, your um, spirit of transparency in the face of these, these very difficult issues. Okay, if, if we've stumped everyone, <laughs> I, we can, we can finish off with one question, which is essentially something that um, you brought up uh, in the beginning of the conversation. Um, and you suggested that governance is the glue that keeps civic space together. And that without figuring out ways to design governance in collusion with the design of material space, um, we are bound to fail. How far is the architect or designer's responsibility in engaging this question of, of governance? Um, how far are you willing to go? And finally, why should we care about cultural infrastructure in the city? Just that. <laughs> I mean, to me, cultural infrastructure is what makes the city a city. It makes it interesting, it gives it its, its character, it's an expression of its residents. Um, it's also like what attracts outside visitors like to either visit or move there. Like, I think more than anything like density or transportation networks, like cultural infrastructure is um, what defines a city. Um, and I think that if those spaces get branded or privatized or taken away or you know, the space for that, then um, that's a huge loss. I also think that this idea of cultural infrastructure is like as an architect, it's how and where we can intervene anywhere along the spectrum of the process. Um, mm -hmm. It sort of gives us back control of the future of the city as opposed to like um, profit-driven development. Um, there's mm -hmm. other kinds of development, but profit-driven development usually gets the first seat at the table. And I think somehow taking back um, an influence over cultural infrastructure, however you might do that, again, like anywhere along the process, is what is how an architect can have more influence over the vitality of the city. Um, and I also think like it's really important that there are spacious spaces for shared experiences um, and an exchange of experience, like cultural infrastructure is where we can we can spend time and space together with people we don't know, people you accidentally come across. It's not planned. It doesn't have to be programmed in like a schedule sense. It's one of the things I love about the skate park is like, yes, there might be events there, but mostly there aren't. And so it's just a defined space for people to come and share time and an experience together, whether you're skating or not. Like, you know, it's, it's like the thing that can attract attention um, it's an active landmark in our neighborhood in a way, but it also just operates without program. There doesn't need to be 
a performance series that someone sponsors and pays for. It's just there. Um, but it also means that people from the suburbs across the country, we get international visitors, as well as like the kids down the street and, um, you know, people from like a tighter metro radius. Like they all have a chance or an opportunity to use the space regardless of political views or financial class or race or creed. Uh, it's just there. Uh, and I think like if you look at a city that cultural infrastructure can be the same thing. Like we all need more spaces for shared experiences that aren't just within our own bubble network of talking heads one to another. Um, and I think, yeah. So, <laughs> just to, to be final for me, I believe, uh, <laughs> and I always say to my neoliberal uh, friend, you know, uh, <laughs> cultural investment is not a loss. And I come from a country where there is a lot of cultural investment and there is a lot of profit of that and, and who have an impact on a lot of uh, citizens of the country. So I believe architecture should, should have some business classes and to formulate the world than when you do cultural investment, cultural structure, cultural uh, park, this is gonna be a profit for the large community and for business, for individual, for everybody. So I believe the language of, of economy is very important in this world of architecture. So Gina and Jean-Louis, thank you so much for sharing this uh, radically imperfect pathway toward the potential for agonistic space in a post-democratic context that stands for pluralism and difference and challenges the surfing of social media as the implicit outcome of the way we relate to each other in an identity-driven world. And thank you for taking the risk, the liability, the, the potential to fail. Um, thank you for fielding the failures um, and um, inspiring a way forward that might not be you know, ideal, but it could be either an ephemeral or an interstitial uh, way for us to uh, build back an alternate society. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Thanks. <A> bientôt. <laughs> Thanks. Uh -huh. <laughs>